Hello. Hi Ben, how are you? Hey, doing well. Doing well. How are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Great. Excited about your session. Yeah, me too. Excited to uh, to get it over with. <laughs> Uh, shall we share your screen? We've got about, we, we've, we're just getting, attendees have all joined um, and the numbers are going up. So attendees, we're just going to join, we're going to start in a few minutes. Um, in about three minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll launch. But uh, Ben, do you want to share your screen just to make sure the slides are up? Excellent. Can you see them okay? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. All right. Let me uh, just get to Okay, I'll enter present mode. Am I going to be having you on different monitors? Okay, that's not quite right. Hmm, so I don't want that to happen. Not that one. Okay, cool. That's the right. Does that look okay for you, Cigar? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That works. We'll just give a couple more minutes uh, for people to join, and then we're going to begin. Cool. All right, I think we can start, Ben. Can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. So welcome, everyone, to week two of the FinTech Saudi Summer Sessions. My name is Sagar. I'm part of the FinTech Saudi team. Really pleased that you're joining us for week two already. Um, last week, we went through the history of FinTech in Saudi Arabia. So we looked at the past, present, and future. Um, we've had a lot of questions about the recording. The recording is available. Um, what I'm going to ask is if Maha can share it in the chat a link to the recording um, with the passcode um, so that anybody can get access to that. We also have a Telegram group set up. Um, if you're not part of that Telegram group, again, we'll add the link into the chat here so you can add yourself to the Telegram group. But now for the main event, what we have today, we've got Ben Lloyd, who's head of digital products at Bank Saudi Francie, who's going to be talking to us about banking and digital banking. This is gonna be an excellent uh, webinar. It will teach you everything. You will leave this webinar is having a great understanding about uh, how banks work, how do banks make money, and what's the future of banking in Saudi Arabia. So I'll hand it over to Ben now. As ever, if you've got any questions, uh, please do add them in the Q&A. If I could request only adding questions in the Q&A, not comments, 
because then we have to filter through all the comments to get to the questions. That would be much appreciated. And what we'll do at the end is we'll have about 10, 15 minutes uh, to answer any of the questions that you have. So Ben, over to you. Thanks, Agar. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is, is Ben Lloyd, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, once again for, I think, about the, the third year of our relationship with, with FinTech Saudi to talk to um, the, the growing talent, the students across the kingdom about banking. Um, I think there is a huge amount to cover about the banking sector and the banking industry, and we've got a huge amount to cover just this evening. Now, because this is a, a lecture or you know part of a training course, there's a lot more content on some of the slides than there would normally be. Um, so there's a huge amount that we need to get through and, and read through and learn together. Uh, the first thing I want to say is it's an incredibly exciting time to be talking about banking and entering uh, financial services industry or the fintech industry. Uh, the rate of change is stratospheric, um, which is largely driven by uh, new technologies, changes to regulatory regimes, uh, pressure um, by international entrants or by customer demand, um, digital technology, cryptographic technology. Um, there's a huge number of things happening uh, in the kingdom and beyond. So it's a very exciting time for me to be talking to you about banking and indeed for you to be starting your careers in, in banking and financial services. A little bit about me. So I've worked in, in banking for nine years um, and before that I've worked in, in venture capital and before that um, I was a fintech entrepreneur and through um, my experiences um, I've had the pleasure of working very closely with Sagar and the fintech Saudi team um, running internships programs and participating um, whenever we can. So it would be great if you would all stay in touch with me and add me on LinkedIn. And if we don't manage to answer any of your questions on the, on the call tonight, because there is a lot to get through, then do feel free to reach me via LinkedIn, or if you can find my email address or number, then you're more than welcome to get in touch. So let's make a start. What is banking and how does it work? We won't be able to cover everything this evening, but we're gonna, we're gonna have a whistle stop tour and hopefully you're gonna learn something. Now, the image that we have of, of the big bank vault, um, you know, in cartoons and in Hollywood and in films, um, a lot of those vaults do no longer exist in banks, even though we do still have that type of facility. However, the thing that that represents, which is the security for the consumer's asset is still very, very much at the core of what we do. So we've replaced vaults um, with security policies, information security teams, um, softwares, hardwares um, that do try to protect your assets as a consumer. Um, but the transition of banking is really charted through that change in imagery from something of um, you know, a big cast iron vault with a passcode to something that is much more technology, technology driven um, and digital. Now, banking is a huge industry. You have many different types of banks. Um, you have retail banks, investment banks, of course, at BSF. Um, we're a universal bank, so we have an investment bank, a retail bank, a merchant bank. Um, we have a, a very large private bank. Uh, this evening, sorry, the <laughs> lights have gone off in the room I'm in, so I'm gonna wave my arms. Uh, tonight, we're gonna focus primarily on retail banks, and, and the reason that we're, we're mostly talking about retail banks today is because um, this is the, the part of the banking industry that uh, is touching most of us. Um, we all um, hopefully will have a, a banking account and will engage with retail banks. We all make digital payments. So hopefully this is the most um, relevant topic for us to touch on. Uh, the, the, the simple definition of banking is that banking is defined as the activity of accepting and safeguarding money owned by other individuals and entities, then lending out this money, these assets in order to conduct economic activities, such as making a profit or simply covering economic expenses. So from an economic perspective, um, a retail bank exists to do exactly as it describes in the definition, but also provide liquidity um, by influencing the money supply in an economy. Uh, this might be done by adjusting interest rates and reviewing credit worthiness of, of the consumers, changing the scorecards, deciding who we lend to. Um, we can also, um, secondly, reduce the probability of a default on loans by pooling together the risks of lending money. Um, so this puts us in a much better place to deal with uh, defaults, um, to meet central bank uh, demands or mandated capital reserve ratios. And the third key point is that we can lower the cost of borrowing by offering competitive interest rates. Um, 
which is linked to the second key role of the banks. Um, so generally, we will increase our profits during economic booms by increasing our interest rates on loans and building cash reserves. Then during a recession, um, we will lower our interest rates in order to stimulate economic growth and spur consumer spending. So the role of the retail bank in the economy is significant and important. Um, it's something everyone here on the call tonight will have in common, um, which is our relationship with the retail bank. However, retail banking in itself is not that straightforward, and there are many categories within the space. The key relationship and the key bank that you'll be most familiar with uh, here in Saudi Arabia will be the notion of a commercial bank. So this is your Al Raji, this is your BSF um, retail bank, and this is your Riyadh bank. Um, these are the banks that will offer you the majority of your products, you know, checking accounts, certificate of deposit accounts, and you'll, there'll be the issue of your credit cards, of your debit cards, and we will generate most of our income through um, the point that we just mentioned, which is the, the net interest margin or the arbitrage between um, the interest rates that we um, pay to savers and the interest rates that we charge to borrowers. Um, within the commercial bank category, uh, you'll also have the likes of um, private banks or specialist banks, um, but these will all fit into the broad definition of, of what is a commercial bank. Within the retail banking space, you will also have uh, in certain markets around the world, the idea of credit unions or building societies. Um, they will be regulated in much the same way as a retail bank. Um, they're much more geographically focused. They'll have far fewer products and they'll be much less technology driven. Um, they generally will charge a much lower rate to borrowers and they'll pay a higher rate to depositors. Um, they are there as part of a community. Um, they're there to, uh, you know, really try and give as much benefit to the stakeholders as possible and they are often not for profit. The third category of retail banks would be um, specialist types of retail banks that have you know perhaps one or two products so we're talking about retail investment funds or specialist retail lenders which don't offer let's say um, deposit accounts or credit cards to the consumers but they may well offer specialist types of loans um, they may structure specialist types of mortgages, for example. So good examples of these um, from the European market would be Paragon or Oak North, um, who have a small range of products that are regulated as a retail bank, um, but they don't have ATMs, they don't have branches, um, but they do provide products for retail banking customers. Hopefully that makes sense. So retail banking, even and of itself, is a very broad subject. Um, the one that we're all most familiar with um, would be called a commercial bank. And this is hopefully what you'll be using um, to make your payments, uh, you know, to borrow when you want to buy a home or you lease a car or have a credit card, um, you'll be interacting with your commercial bank. We're gonna give a very brief history of um, banking in, in modern times. Now, the idea of exchange and bartering uh, go a long predates uh, the, the idea of the banking sector. Um, but there are three main phases in, in, in modern history, and it's in the, the middle phase that's represented here, really where the, the growth within banking for retail consumers come. And, and this is because um, the, the growth of technology, the advent of technology, um, allowed banks to um, improve their, the way that they uh, opened accounts, the way they um, did credit risk profiling for customers, the way they built school cars, the way they distributed their products. So really the growth of retail banking um, took hold um, from the 1950s globally and the expansion was rapid branches. Um, we saw a lot of technology innovation around the distribution of cash and products such as um, payment cards at the very end of the uh, 1980s. Now in the 1990s, um, largely driven by technology, um, retail banking started to shrink for a number of reasons. Uh, consumer confidence was hit, dot-com boom, um, bubble rather, and you saw the rise of shadow banking or non-banking financial institutions um, and indeed the beginning of fintech, um, which started eating into the core business of the bank. Across the timeline here, um, there are three main initial functions of, of retail banking, um, which we've already touched on, but they are to pool and allocate savings across um, the organisations bridge information asymmetries, so using technology to build profiles on customers, um, to um, facilitate payments between banks um, and making sure that the credit endeavors between different entities matched up, and to finance businesses by providing loans and stimulating the economy. 
the fourth function of banking and another way that which, which we generate lots of um, revenue as an industry um, was payments and in particular the advent of, of digital payments from um, you know the mid 20th century um, or sorry the mid to late 20th century uh, was something that now banks could provide so international payments digital payments online payments um, so the four function of banking um, into the fray um, really uh, in the middle period here in the middle phase of, of the growth of retail banking. The most interesting phase of banking um, I believe is just beginning and in part that has been shaped by what has happened at the beginning of the 21st century. At the beginning of the 2000s, the early 2000s, um, there was a huge consolidation of retail banks globally, uh, in particular across the USA, where lots of state banks merge with national banks. And you saw the entrance of non-banking financial institutions. And what do we mean by non-banking financial institutions? Well, these would be large corporate players um, who are beginning to find their way into the financial services community by offering um, products such as you know, insurance products, pension products, mutual fund products, um, remittance, money market products. Uh, specialist financing products, security products. And from the early 2000s, facilitated by technology and changes in the regulatory environment, these organizations started to um, eat into the market share that, that banks would have. So um, as of today, um, you know, in the top three market caps globally of financial services institutions, um, two of those organizations are not banks. Um, they are fintechs, if you like, one is Visa and one is MasterCard. Um, going back in time somewhat to 2001, um, there were four non-banks in the um, top 15 largest market caps of financial services institutions. So the growth of the entrance and the growth of non-financial um, banking institutions is something that um, happened since the 2000s and has changed and increased competition for us as organizations, as banking organizations, and created lots of new use cases and products for the consumer. We also saw from the 2000s the um, culmination of lots of technological advances that happened in the late 90s, namely the shift to internet banking, the distribution of banking services across um, digital devices. Um, I can't remember exactly the year that the first iPhone came out, but I think it was 2006, 2007. Um, you know, these new distribution channels um, have allowed banks to distribute their services in, in different ways. And more recently, from 2015, when the first open banking initiatives have been uh, mandated by central banks uh, initially across Europe and, and the US. And of course, we know this year that uh, the open banking mandate is being delivered by SAMA, uh, which, of course, BSF is a, an active participant in, in that space, um, has really, again, changed uh, the opportunities that exist for banks. Um, and the value that banks can provide around um, standardizing APIs, using our data in new ways, monetizing them in, in, in different ways, uh, and serving our customers in different ways and creating new products for those customers, some of which we will um, touch on in, in a couple of slides. So the, the, the change and the acceleration um, and the evolution of the banking business model um, has really been facilitated by technology historically forever. And since the early 2000s, um, this is only accelerated, driven by technology, by changes in customer uh, requirements, demand, and of course, advances um, in technology and the way that the regulator thinks about that. I'm not going to talk about this slide, um, but the deck will be circulated at the end of the talk. So you will get to see some of the M&A activity that happened within the banking space. Um, between 2000 and, and 2010. Um, so here you'll see the consolidation of the, of the banking market, which I um, have already mentioned. So what is the difference between traditional retail banking, which now you have a brief history of and an understanding of the core products and revenue drivers? What is the difference between traditional banking and digital banking? Now, it's sometimes quite hard to see the difference and decipher it, um, but we're going to give it a go uh, over the next couple of slides. Your traditional banking is exactly what we've been talking about, which um, enables transactions, um, enables you to deposit, enables you to borrow, usually via a branch, um, your laptop, your phone, your computer, and 
online banking in particular has revolutionized the way that we access traditional banking services, but online banking in and of itself is not the same as digital banking. The things that do fall into the category of, digital, uh, of traditional banking, of course, all of these traditional products and services, which you'll have in your banking apps today. Now, digital banking goes much deeper. Um, it is a comprehensive re-engineering of all of the processes, both back office and front office, all of the products that customers will use, all of the internal systems of an organization and their third parties and integrators that help facilitate the banking technology ecosystem. Digital banking is huge. Um, it's transforming banking everywhere. And we're going to talk in the next slide about some of the key differences between digital banking and traditional banking. Now, with digital banking, you have a very high level of internal process automation. Um, you may have artificial intelligence driving lending decisions. You may have mach machine learning um, plugged in when you have assess eligibility for account creation. Um, you may have predictive offerings, which will pull in different data feeds from around all of your different uh, assets or your different banking accounts. In particular, when open banking goes live, this is something that will um, become the norm. Um, and as a result of um, all of that automation and personalization that can take place as a result of digital banking, the bank has the opportunity to distribute some of these services more cheaply um, to reduce its overheads, to reduce its legacy technology stack, to become more scalable, um, to plug in new microservices or products or fintechs when they become available. Now, a digital bank may also be distributed online through mobile or perhaps even through a branch. Um, they will still be compliant to the same regulatory standards. They may have higher security standards. Um, but out of the, the, you know, the two notions of traditional banking and, and digital banking, um, digital banking is um, much broader. It's made up of a combination of mobile banking and online banking. And some of the benefits are that it's incredibly effective from a cost perspective for a, a large legacy organization or a new digital bank to build an organization this way because the overheads are much lower. Um, instead of having a, an underwriting team of 100, you may have a few uh, data scientists who are building algorithms um, to build the scorecards and approve the loans. The usability from a consumer perspective um, might be significantly improved. Of course, there'll be more products available and they'll be more suitable for you. Um, you'll have 24 seven service availability. Uh, you might have a marketplace where you can integrate some other products, apps and services that are relevant for you, or indeed these may be recommended to you by the digital banking platform. Um, you will have a, a fully personalized banking experience um, where different interest rates, different products, offerings will be completely tailored to you. Uh, the digital bank will be intelligent enough to recognize when you're spending too much money in Starbucks and you need to not spend as much money in Starbucks this week. It can notify you on that. It can automatically restrict your payments to Starbucks, potentially. Um, it might give you automated investment and savings offerings, which are based on a holistic view of your overall portfolio as a consumer or your relation with the bank. So really we're gonna see digital banking as the engine that will drive your financial destiny as a consumer. Um, it will be proactive rather than passive in the relationship that you have with it. Now, the key thing is you will be able to see, and we will see, and we are going to experience um, many more services that will become available through uh, digital banking channels rather than traditional banking channels. So integrations with your cryptocurrency wallets, your NFT wallets become really, really simple. Um, recommendations for investments or automatic execution of those investments becomes really simple. You might bring in alternative asset classes, um, PFM tools. So understanding your uh, financial position, your portfolio across all of your different bank accounts, um, using some PFM, some personal financial management tools to recommend um, uh, what you do from a wealth management perspective. And there'll be more configurability from you as a consumer. You'll be able to put in more changes, more blocks. Um, your account will truly be your account and you'll be able to configure it and control it in a way um, which before you have been unable to. And the big driver of this is the use of data within digital banking. So 
even in the 1980s and 1990s, the, the, the chief executives of Citibank, which is one of the most innovative uh, financial services organizations globally, you know, banking is just bits and bytes. Information about money has become almost as important as, as money itself. Um, the ownership of data, the intelligent use of data, uh, the augmentation of that data with uh, data science models, machine learning, um, artificial intelligence. Um, this is digital banking. And that's not just on the consumer product side of things, but that's also around uh, the internal processes. So um, things like approval processes within a bank, information security processes, uh, credit approval processes, all of these things can be um, changed and updated using digital technologies and digital tools in a way which the traditional banks currently don't do. So I'm very hopeful that everyone has a high level understanding now of, of, what, the, of what the difference between a digital bank is and a, a traditional bank and can understand why so many banks, um, both in the kingdom and globally, are investing very heavily in transitioning from being a traditional bank, traditional retail bank, into a digital retail bank because it's better for the consumer and it gives the banks more opportunities to earn more revenue from the customer by manufacturing products that are perfect for them, predicting their next move, predicting um, the next product that they want to buy and when they want to buy it, using all of the fantastic data that we as banks have access to. Now, we wouldn't do any of this if we couldn't make money from it. So we're going to touch on how banks make money. And, and I think this is a, a really interesting subject. You know, like I said, we all have a banking relationship or I imagine most of us have a, have a banking relationship. Um, but very few people will understand exactly how uh, banks are making money from you as a consumer or you as a customer. To speak in a huge generalization and, and to make an oversimplification, banks make money in two ways interest income and fee-based income. Some banks diversify away from that using their universal banking um, products such as you know, investment banking, asset management, um, selling other services from within their banking group, um, which may add additional revenue streams, but purely from a retail banking perspective, uh, we make money from interest and we make money from fees. So what does that mean? Let's dive into each one of them and then you'll see how we as BSF and other organizations uh, make money and, and why um, our customers and the products we bought for them are so important. So interest rate is incredibly important to, to, to all banks as the primary revenue driver. Um, the interest rate is the amount owed as a percentage of the principal amount, which is in summary, the amount borrowed or deposited. In the short term, the interest rate for banks and for customers will be set by the central banks, which will regulate the level of interest rates to promote a healthy economy at a macro level. Um, but for banks, the interest rates will be changed as a result of supply and demand pressures. So high demand for long-term maturity debt instruments, such as mortgages, um, will lead to a higher price and lower interest rates for those mortgages. Conversely, low demand for long-term maturity instruments such as mortgages uh, will lead to lower prices and higher interest rates. So the way that we benefit from this and the changes within interest rates at a macro level and at a micro level um, is by paying depositors, so people who have a savings account with us or a current account, a low interest rate on their savings and charging borrowers a higher interest rate. So the arbitrage between the interest rate that we're paying to savers or depositors and the interest rate that we're charging to borrowers, those borrowers might be other retail consumers, they may be large corporates, they might be um, lenders, you know, they might be non-banking financial institutions who are borrowing money from us. Um, we will charge them a higher interest rate and then the arbitrage between those two um, activities is how we'll generate most of our money. Um, we need to manage all of the credit risk between that because the consumers um, may, of course, default on those loans. So we benefit as a banking organization from an environment where interest rates are increasing, where interest rates are going up, 
which they are now, of course, which is very good for, for the banking sector. And this is because we lock in interest rates with long-term savers or depositors, and we'll pay them a lower rate over the long term. And then as interest rates increase at a macroeconomic level, um, we can charge the borrower with this higher interest rate, and then that will increase our spread. Conversely, if there's an economic environment where interest rates are decreasing, then fixed term deposits are locked. Relatively, they'll then be paying a higher interest rate, but we will have to charge a lower interest rate to the lender, reducing our spread. Hopefully, that was easy enough to follow. We, of course, charge an interest rate to borrowers on credit cards, on home loans, on commercial loans, on personal finance products. Um, so there are a whole range of, of different products available within, within the retail banks um, for which we can charge and we do charge an interest rate. The second revenue driver is fee-based income. So account creation fee, custodian fees, payment fees, IPS fees, salary fees, SADAD and MOI, we generate fees, even though consumers don't see that. Um, Visa, MasterCard fees, um, you know, any kind of product that you buy from us, um, we will charge a fee. Um, the, the best products for us are those that we um, charge a fee and an interest rate. We, so we, we, can, we can get um, two revenue streams from, from the same, um, same product. So fee-based income for us is, is, is quite attractive because it's a relatively stable um, income stream over time. It's not impacted directly by changes to interest rates at a central bank level. Um, and in particular during economic downturns when interest rates might be artificially low, which they have been over the last 10 years, um, fee-based income is an opportunity for banks to generate um, more revenue during those environments. Okay. So it's a big topic, a couple of slides, hopefully that's a useful summary about how banks make money. The next key thing I want to talk about is technology. Technology drives everything in banking. Banks are technology organizations now. Uh, they're also much more than that, they're risk management organizations, they're treasury management organizations. Um, but a huge proportion of the bank's overhead and the bank's costs and the strategic initiatives and the investments that will be going on inside a bank will be um, within the technology organization. So everything that will facilitate your account creation or you making a payment um, is as a result of a huge number of integrations with services around the world, um, which are powered centrally um, by what would be called a core banking platform within the organization. And within that core banking platform, you have the source of truth for um, every credit endeavor that's ever happened, every payment type that you've ever made. Uh, incredibly complex, incredibly ginormous, and technology has for a very long time and continues to drive everything in, um, in technologies and in particular digital banks. You'll see the largest teams are the development teams or the engineering teams. Banks have also really been the drivers of, of technology innovation um, right back to the 1920s when you know the first accounting machines, the first kind of very basic rudimentary computers were, were created. Um, by the 1980s, 70% of all transactions within, within banks were undertaken on computers. Um, since the, you know, the, the beginning of the 21st century, um, the change in distribution of all banking services, uh, the change of payment types, you know, the advent of things like instant payments, it's all driven by technology. Um, the first uh, payment cards um, were all created by, um, by banks. Um, so banks have always been at the cornerstone of, of technology, technology revolution, technology change, and we're seeing this intensify. And what I see across the, the phases here at the top and the, the, the fourth phase, which we're currently in, is the, what I've called the decentralization phase. And this is part of what will become the future of banking and, and some of the topics that we're talking about uh, today and some of the topics that we talk about in the bank on a daily basis um, across all of the different divisions. 
are about tokenization, decentralized finance, cryptography, uh, open banking. We're entering a new phase within technology uh, in, in the banking sphere because the technology has become much more powerful and the access to data is becoming um, much simpler, easier and cheaper for uh, organizations like us, but also for fintechs um, to start eating parts of, of, our, of our business model. Global payments, huge adoption. Um, I don't know how many more years there will be physical cash in certain markets. Um, the regulatory environment has, of course, started evolving to support data privacy, to support digital payments, to support the changing of data to improve the security of payment types. Um, you know, the idea of 3DS and the PCI rules uh, have all been imposed and brought in um, to protect consumers and these are all regulatory driven. And another key thing that uh, is, is happening is that we are seeing technology firms starting to behave like banks. Now, I, I'm a believer that banks need to start behaving more like technology firms um, before technology firms behave completely like banks. Um, but we have seen intent expressed by Facebook, Google, Amazon to enter uh, what would traditionally be parts of the banking business model, whether in the case of Google, that's around account management, PFM, in the case of Amazon and Apple, things like Amazon wallets, Apple wallets, Google Pay. Some of these services traditionally provided by banks are being disintermediated and now taken over by uh, the big tech companies who are much better at responding to consumer needs. They use data much more effectively than we do. So it's increasingly important for, for banks to invest in technology to predict the next move of some of these large monolithic tech companies and try and behave in the same way as them. As a result of all of this change, a huge number of new opportunities are being created um, by the changes within the customer demand, the regulatory environment, and um, powered by technological advances. Chris Skinner is a commentator on everything digital within banking, and I would strongly recommend his book, Digital Bank Strategies to Launch and Become a Digital Bank. Uh, which was released, I think, in, in 2014, so it's, it's already out of date um, by the timelines of some of the changes that we've seen within digital banking in the last um, six or seven years. Um, but Chris is absolutely right that every part of the banking value chain is being nibbled at. So you have the likes of FIDOR um, chipping away at the core uh, deposit model, deposit taking model of, of, of banks. You have Zopa um, who are tackling the credit markets, Lending Circle, Funding Circle, 20 others um, that are chipping away at the opportunity for banks to build specialist lending products. You have Currency Cloud who are nibbling away at uh, cross-border activities as well as uh, the likes of Wise and many, many others. Kickstarter is uh, nibbling away at the commercial banking operations. Um, you have many more of these as well that are doing a similar thing. eToro is taking away some of the uh, income that we could provide by um, arranging or promoting or um, facilitating investments for our clients into the capital markets. You'll have heard of Wealthify, Robinhood, Free Trade, um, they're all doing the same. So facilitated by technology, um, many parts of the banking value chain are being disrupted. And what I've noticed over the last three years is that the, the, the points within the value chain that are being disrupted are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the journeys are becoming increasingly unbundled. So an example would be a fintech such as Bridget. Um, and Bridget specializes in one thing. Uh, they're a US-based company, which is using open banking APIs to predict when you're going to go overdrawn in your checking accounts. And then if you're about to go overdrawn, they will, um, they will provide a micro loan to that account to prevent you from going overdrawn and not um, incurring punitive fees from your bank by going overdrawn. And this is a very small use case, a very small product from our perspective as a universal bank, as a, as a large retail bank. 
um, but we're seeing the value chain being chipped away in all kinds of ways by, by fintechs. And um, as we see the, the maturity of the open banking model and in the next few years, the open finance model, um, I think we're going to see um, lots of activity around the continuous unbundling of, of various moments or points within the banking value chain. And some of those traditional products, which we've listed above, are, are, are waiting to be disrupted by, um, by the fintechs within the kingdom. Something that I am a believer in and a predictor of is a notion which, which I call bed to bed banking. And this is a representation of what is happening in, in banking, uh, in my opinion, and where some of the opportunities lie. And we talk to uh, the likes of Amazon around you know, their day to day tracking, their 24 hour tracking of their customers via applications such as Alexa or Google, um, uh, Google um, Assistant. And the idea is that you wake up in the morning, your bank will know what time you set your alarm. It will know what time you make your coffee because you will make your coffee using a smart kettle and you will order your coffee beans using a fully integrated um, payment system with the kettle um, because you've run out of coffee beans. It will know what time you book your Uber or your transport to work um, because we'll be using shared cars by that point. It will know where you order your breakfast from or your coffee from and how much you pay for it. And it will know how many steps you do every day. Um, it will know, therefore, whether to offer you a higher or lower uh, insurance premium uh, on your health insurance. It will know um, when you walk into a travel agent because there'll be location-based security. So it will know when it can push you offers for travel insurance or uh, discounts or loyalty or rewards points with an airline. Um, it will know where you work, how long you work, where you sit down, uh, it will know when you receive your salary, how much your salary is, it will know what time you take your Uber home, um, it will know time you cook dinner, it will know which time you go back to bed. And this idea of bed to bed banking um, is something that, that we talk about in the organisation. So where across this timeline within a 24 hour period for a customer, can we today or will we in the future be able to use our technology to distribute products to them? And like I said, it might be offering them a cheaper way to pay it might be providing them with burner cards when they do their online shopping so that they're protected. It might be reducing their insurance premium. It might be offering them um, better rates on a credit card um, because we can see that they are not going to revolve in time or they're going to um, uh, incur some additional fees. This idea of bed-to-bed -bed banking is becoming a reality and the organisations such as uh, Amazon, etc., are in a really strong position to be able to do this. Now, it may become um, or it may create a dependency on big technologies. Um, it may result in banks becoming the losers because we're unable to bundle journeys in this way. So we're seeing an unbundling as a result of the fintechs. We might see a rebundling of products and services and journeys um, in the future. The bank could become the platform in all of this. So the bank might see an unbundling of all of its products and services to fintechs. And then we might be able to rebundle them and distribute them, uh, even though they won't be products that we manufacture. Uh, they could be products that we can distribute and power um, across the day to day relationships that uh, technology uh, with a capital T will have with the consumer and with all of their financial services needs throughout the day. That model is actually already being seen by um, many super apps that are out there. So in Indonesia, you have um, an organization called Gojek. In the Philippines, you have an organization called Grow. Between them, they probably have 200 million app downloads and they provide all of your mobility needs, all of your food needs, your e-commerce needs, your banking needs, and they do it all within one app and they provide an intelligent wrapper around that so that you can optimize your relationship with your money. So it's already happening um, and the access points that um, there will be for this type of product, I think, will increase and the number of markets in which we will see these super platforms will increase. Now, the role for the bank in that is something that um, has yet to be determined or decided in most markets, but it offers a very uh, realistic, credible opportunity for us to explore different models, invest in technology, broaden what we do power the fintech ecosystem and create a bed-to-bed -bed banking experience for, for our customers.
going back to what I said at the beginning, that it's one of the, the absolute most interesting and exciting times within banking and within fintech. Um, part of that excitement for us is as a result of um, the world's value being tokenized. I think it was in 2001 that Citibank hired 200, 250 people in their digital assets team. We've seen the UK Central Bank already um, tokenize currency and make digital payments or blockchain payments on there. We've seen banks in the region, uh, including our central bank here in Saudi Arabia, um, talking about central bank digital currencies and, and offering some commentary on what could happen next and what the position is. So there are a huge number of assets, um, both financial and banking related or non-banking related that we are seeing becoming tokenized and capturing that value in a non-fungible way across a huge number of asset types. Um, how this will look for banks, again, is something that we're currently trying to predict. What does this mean for, for retail banks? Now, the absolute best paper that I can recommend all of you to read is in the sources um, here, which is the regulated internet value. Um, so pop that into Google and have a look at the regulated internet value. Um, and in here, you will see how retail banks and corporate banks can start to um, tokenize the value and fuse the traditional um, store of value, which is, uh, you know, the customer's deposits or the, um, the reserves with digital tokens. And there's an infusion between uh, the traditional banking model, digital banking model and, and tokenization. We know that this is something of a, that is very, in some ways, early stage, controversial um, within Saudi Arabia. And I'm going to talk you through uh, some of the, the, the stages and states of that in, in a moment. But globally, um, we're seeing huge growth within the digital assets and payment space. Um, in three months, in 2021, uh, there were 31 new fintech blockchain unicorns. We're seeing Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, um, all of the large investment banks globally investing in many of these blockchain companies. JP Morgan announced at the beginning of 2022 that they would be investing $12 billion this year in digital technology, uh, including the acquisition of several blockchain companies. So the way that our digital banking model, which we've described, um, will behave and will operate within the next five to 10 years is something which we are currently trying to work out within the banking sector. So what about in Saudi Arabia? Well, across the GCC, there are different regulations and, and, and rules. Um, however, uh, despite the fact that um, within Saudi Arabia, cryptocurrencies and digital assets fit within a, a, a grey area uh, in that the, the government has offered uh, some guidance on them, uh, which is um, that it's illegal um, to purchase or to, to trade with crypto uh, for banks to facilitate that trading. Uh, there's also no consequences if you do do that. However, Saudi Arabia is in, in third place when it comes to crypto ownership within, within GCC. And, we're seeing that generally that is among the younger demographic. Um, so Saudi Arabia, of course, has a very young demographic anyway, um, but people who are you know, below the age of 40, um, the, the millennials, if, if you will, um, with relatively high monthly income are very, very over-indexed when it comes to, to crypto ownership. And Saudi Arabia has also launched its, full, its first NFT project. It has plenty of NFT artists, um, including one, run by Princess Reem, which was listed on OpenSea, the world's largest NFT trading platform um, globally recently. So we are seeing already the, the narrative within the conversations we have in BSF and the conversations we have with the regulator and with other banks, with our peers, both in the market and outside of the market is shifting um, to talk about, okay, well, what is digital assets going to mean for us? How is it going to impact our um, operating model? What um, products will change? Um, what do we need to do? How do we position? What new technology do we need? Um, so I think it's an incredibly exciting time for any fintechs or any potential new partners of BSF 
uh, or other banks, of course, um, who are um, coming up with new use cases and new products, new understanding, new strategies within the space um, to start talking to the legacy incumbent banking sector because um, we're all trying to work out how we can provide as much value to consumers by leveraging this new technology, digitizing further, um, and becoming more relevant to our customers who want to access new products in new ways. So we're almost out of time and the, the final um, section of this presentation is something that, that any other banker that's on this call will um, hopefully be supportive of, of this commentary and, and this narrative around there currently being a war for talent within Saudi Arabia and indeed globally when it comes to finding the people that we need to work in, in banking organizations. Fintech Saudi has been very kind and generous to BSF here in the provision of our very talented graduates um, from all kinds of backgrounds, whether that's business analysis or computer science. Um, but we are currently hiring for a, a huge number um, of the um, skills that are required for us to get through the next phase of our digital revolution and evolution. And um, I talk to people even at STC, the telco side, not the banking side, uh, and many other large organizations such as Aramco, who are all facing similar um, challenges when it comes to um, finding the right talent to support and advance our digital agenda. So I thought I'd highlight here um, for the, the, the students or the prospective interns that are here as part of this course this evening, what, what we're looking for. Um, so digital and technical skills combined with uh, financial skills, of course, is, is critical. So the traditional functions remain the same around actuary, investment, finance, risk, uh, and accounting. But the digital skills really is where we're seeing um, a significant demand across the world uh, and, and something that all banks um, that are represented as partners of FinTech Saudi will be focused and trying to fill those, those gaps. So uh, any computer science graduates or information technology graduates, uh, any engineers, any self-taught engineers, uh, business analysts, people who've got MBAs and understand um, how to deliver digital strategies, uh, anything around production support, production engineering, quality analysis, front end, back end, um, solutions architecture. Uh, these roles are the most coveted um, now uh, globally. And because banks are technology businesses, um, we are trying to hire all of the very best talent that's out there. And if you fit into that category, then um, I urge you to reach out to uh, any of the banks because they'll be very, very happy to meet you and have a conversation about how you can start powering uh, the next phase of the uh, financial revolution. I'm going to wrap up there. Um, like I said, we, we haven't had very much time this evening to cover some very, some very meaty topics. You will be able to find me or reach out to me on all of the usual channels uh, if you do want to find out more and I believe that Fintech Saudi will be circulating uh, this material and, and the references and sources um, at some point in the future. Um, so before I take any questions I just want to wish you all luck with the, the rest of your Fintech Saudi course. I think there are four more weeks to go um, so good luck. I hope you complete it and learn lots of valuable information. So thank you very much Sagar. Thank you, Ben, for an excellent talk. That was a that was a whirlwind uh, stop around around banking. I really appreciate us covering so much in such a short space of time. Uh, just one, just one thing: this is the second week out of ten, so there are another eight weeks to go for the fintech summer session. Uh, before I go into Q and A, I just wanted to do a bit of housekeeping. So this session is being recorded, and you will receive a recording for this session. You will also receive the slides for this. If you haven't already joined the Telegram group. Um, Maha will write the Telegram group uh, in the chat again, uh, just in case you missed it at the beginning. Um, we'll also add a recording of last week's session in the group as well. Um, in terms of certificates, so the policy has been that try to join as many of these sessions as you can. Um, if you can able to join at least eight of the sessions out of the 10 live, then you will receive a certificate at the end of the 10 weeks. So even if you missed last week's one, you're still eligible to get a certificate as long as you join eight, well, this one and plus another seven uh, of the next eight, next eight weeks, which we have. Uh, so those were the, ground, the housekeeping sort of points I had. Um, now coming on to the questions, we've got quite a few, so I'm just gonna fire them through uh, to you, Ben, if you don't mind. Uh, the first one is just around the transition from traditional to digital banks. So what, 
how, how is this transition happening for a lot of the banks, particularly around what are the effects on their revenue streams? What are the risks associated with it? And then the, a follow-up question to that is, some banks consider themselves a digital bank if they've got, say, a mobile application and you can do the certain services online. So what would you say is the real differential for a digital bank over just an online bank? Yeah, so, so, so I, think, I think we covered we covered a lot of that in, in the talk. Um, how, the first question is how, how we're doing it. And um, most banks, um, if you're in the industry or broadly in the sector, you, you will have heard are undergoing a core banking transformation. And really, this is the, the beginning of those journeys. And, and that is where we um, expose some of our internal technical architecture via a range of APIs um, so they can be more easily used by, um, by partners or by customers. Um, so it starts with an enterprise level transformation of the core technology that's holding uh, the bank together. Uh, that comes with a huge amount of risks and, and banks are in the business of, of risk management. Um, you know, the, the board of a bank gets appointed not because of their ability to generate lots of revenue, but their ability to manage risks. Um, because if you don't, then you'll go to jail. So risk management is key. So there are a huge number of risks when it comes to doing a technical or digital transformation around the provision of services, the loss of data, the successful migration of that data, the service interruption, um, the meeting all of the regulatory compliance um, points across cybersecurity, um, of which there are hundreds, and uh, making sure that all of those are captured and approved and tested. So there are a huge number of risks, and, and one of the risks that falls outside of that is, of course, the cost to the bank um, as a result of doing this transformation. They're exorbitantly expensive um, for organisations, and so in the short term, you see a, a significant peak in the uh, cost or the expenditure for technology or the you know the centralised um, technology cost centre. Uh, we'll be investing a huge amount while it's doing this migration, but the rationale is that once you have done it, the costs of running those legacy services, those legacy technology services, some of which might be you know twenty years old and. Um, very few of us have any technology in our lives that's, you know, older than three or four years old. And yet there are many services in, in banks just because of their complexity uh, and the cost of implementation that have been around for you know, 15, 15 plus years. Um, so the cost is, is very, very high. Um, one of the ways that digital banking can help mitigate that risk in the future um, is by being much more um, compostable, having a microservices architecture, being able to plug in third parties more easily, um, being able to scale more easily, for example, by the use of um, cloud data centers rather than on-prem data centers. So the idea is that by implementing a fully digital banking model, uh, you can reduce your technology costs, but also you're going to be reducing other operating costs, such as uh, the number of people that you need to do loan collection or the number of people you need in banking operations, because you can do much more process um, automation um, within a digital banking platform. Excellent. And I guess to just follow a question on digital banks, and, and of course, STC Pay released the news around making making a large loss, 440 million reals. But and, and we see that across digital banks across the world, where they, they are large loss making. So, so why is that? If a lot of this is around cost um, savings, and um, which they're making, and how do they get to that level of profitability? Yeah, it's a good question, and, and one of the things that hurts is interesting to us as, as bankers and uh, bankers that are focusing on you know, the digitization of services is that uh, we're in some ways held to different standards to other technology businesses. So for example, Amazon didn't become profitable for 19 years because it invested heavily in, in technology and we're doing the same, or banks are doing the same. You know, it's very complex and very expensive, um, but it results in a lower customer acquisition cost and will increase your return on equity over time. The key reason that most of these organizations uh, across the world, the digital banking organizations are posting loss is because so much of uh, the relationship that banks have with customers is um, built by trust, uh, is built over a long time. Uh, the customer life cycle is generally, you know, you create a checking account or a deposit account, you have a debit card, then maybe in a year you trust them enough to have a credit card, then maybe in five or six years you'll have a home loan. And, Going back to um, the discussion around interest rates, you know, the, the idea of long-term uh, loans, long-term deposits is really how a bank starts to become um, incredibly profitable. And, and that takes time. You know, a bank that's been around for two or three years will not have any long-term deposits because it's only been around for a couple of years. 
Um, so it's not unusual to see the new digital banks posting a loss in the early years. Uh, the idea for them in the early years is to invest in scalable technology, build the trust with the consumer so that in the future that consumer feels comfortable and ready to um, you know, take their home loan through you or take more credit cards, personal finance products from you. Um, I think that the disruption that happened after the 2008 financial crisis um, in many markets has resulted in banks becoming uh, relatively low trust organisations. Uh, the morality of banking and bankers you know, haven't been bailed out by uh, the government in many markets uh, is questionable and it's taken consumers a long time to start trusting banks again. And then you're asking consumers to trust a brand new entity which they don't understand, they don't know the value adds. Um, so, so that will take a little bit of time. However, what we are seeing is the digital banks globally that have been around for between five and ten years are now starting to post net profit, um, which I think is really interesting. Uh, and I think over the next couple of years, you're going to see some of those digital banks um, posting higher net profits than some of the larger incumbent banks, just because um, you know their uh, risk-adjusted um, return on equity will be much higher because they have all of the process automation, they have all of the uh, smart lending models, they have all of the customers at much lower cost, uh, and they're not paying as many operators within the organisation. So I think we're going to see in the next five years the um, digital banking models mature, and that will be reflected hopefully in their balance sheets. I appreciate we're, we're quite close to the time. Uh, we've only got a few more minutes left. So I just want to fire two last point questions to you, which uh, we got quite a few comments around. One is around open banking um, and how will open banking change the banking industry and how would it actually benefit banks opening up their data to uh, third parties? And the second question is just around some of the technology you mentioned, DeFi, uh, tokenization, um, and AI. They're the sort of three ones which have come up. Um, how do they affect banking? And, and just so everyone's aware, we will be having week 10, I think, is about blockchain and DeFi. So we do have a whole lecture on DeFi. So we don't need to cover too much in this um, session. But if you give this, give a few, few thoughts around that, Ben. Sure, I'll do my best. Open banking will absolutely change the, the banking sector um, without any shadow of a doubt. However, the biggest beneficiaries of that is the consumer, not the bank. What we've seen in other open banking activated markets is that there's been a relatively slow development or adoption of new and exciting and interesting use cases. Again, I think part of that is because of a relatively low trust environment around data sharing and around trusting your bank. Uh, however, the banks that do nothing and just implement and meet the minimum requirements of the SAMA open banking directive will not benefit from the implementation of open banking. Um, they are likely to lose customers, uh, in fact, over time. The opportunity for banks is to not just implement the minimum requirements of the SAMA directive, but instead to offer new services to their customers, such as integrated PFM, uh, integrated accounts, uh, you know, showing all of your different checking accounts in Saudi Arabia in one platform, allowing you to process payments between them, um, overlaying intelligent tools such as identifying transactions that you could save the consumer money on, that you can provide them offers on. Um, that level of intelligent PFM, which could be driven by um, artificial intelligence even, um, by the account aggregation layer, could create huge opportunities for banks. Or the bank could do nothing and they will see the other more innovative banks start to do this account aggregation. Now, the other opportunity uh, outside of the direct relationship with the consumer is the relationship that banks will have with uh, non-banking entities. So uh, payment processing services, data processing services, um, all of these TPPs um, which want access to our data, uh, they may also want other services from the bank. So when we have that relationship, they're extracting our data via our API gateway, we have the opportunity to distribute many more um, services and APIs with them um, that could add value to them, that could increase our customer numbers indirectly. So uh, the banks that are being active and strategic in the implementation of the Open Banking Directive um, 
have a huge number of opportunities, those that will just meet the minimum requirements um, are likely to see account switching and a reduction in uh, being a primary account for a user, possibly. Um, do I think the change will happen necessarily that quickly? Uh, all I can do is look at what's happened in other markets where I think the rate of adoption has been relatively low. But we have opportunities around consent management and PFM and other areas that could increase the adoption within Saudi Arabia to a higher level than in some other markets. Um, hopefully that covers open banking. Um, in terms of DeFi, AI, tokenization, I mean, it's, it's just an incredibly broad and interesting topic. Um, like I said, I, I really would urge you to read the, the Citibank paper, which I've referenced in the, in the presentation. And what really it gets to is that we don't quite know exactly how this is going to affect the banking sector yet. And it offers a few credible options or uh, alternatives for the way the banks are currently structured. Um, the, the, the option that they believe is, is most likely is for us to start tokenizing existing digital payments. So you have this hybrid um, centralization and decentralization across the payments. And I think that this is something that most banks will, will advocate for. Um, we don't know what the regulators will do. Uh, we don't really know what the regulators think. We're a firm believer in, in BSF that uh, there has to be uh, a government, uh, intra-government level discussion on how to transform the banking sector to facilitate uh, transactions or the tokenization of assets globally. Um, we believe there has to be a, a, an international standard, mostly to protect consumers. Um, to close some of the loopholes that exist within, uh, you know, the the, um, the the more sort of darker sides of the use cases for um, cryptocurrencies and, and NFTs. And this is something that we're, we're advocating with, along with some of our partners, that we will hopefully see some central banks um, providing guidance on products such as central bank digital currencies, um, and then maybe certain types of payments that are executed um, by a decentralized. Uh, mechanism or exchange, um, but at the moment this is this is a big question for us and a topic which you're going to have covered in I think week seven, um, and I'll probably be tuning in um, to learn a bit more about that myself. I'm looking forward to it. Again, thank you very much, Ben. Unfortunately, that's all the time we've gone for. Apologies for going over a few minutes um, over our time, but I hope that everyone on this call has enjoyed this and really enjoyed the session and learned a lot from this about digital banking. Next week, we have week three of the FinTech Saudi Summer Sessions, and that's going to be covering everything to do with payments. So today, you've got a good overview of banking. Next week, you're going to have a good overview of payments um, from MasterCard. So that's a really exciting session to join. As mentioned, all the links which uh, Ben's mentioned in his talk, we'll get links, we'll get those links and we'll add them into the Telegram group as well. Um, so you've got, you'll have those, those links in the Telegram group. Um, and other than that, as Ben mentioned, do feel free to connect with him, with us on LinkedIn, um, follow us and you'll get more information from there and any questions that you have, you can certainly uh, reach Ben on there as well. So without further ado, thank you again, Ben, for your time today, really appreciate it. And thank you all for joining and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you.